I'm fit to serve the state. And uh, if that's true, then perhaps the country won't be any worse off. Well, therein lies the rub, because as long as you continue to violate known established legal precepts like Brown versus Board of Education, when you did what you did to Ralph Holder, and as long as you allow bad cops like Martin Dunn and his lawyer, Dan Mullen, to lie about me and, and say that I was disbarred, that I had fantasies about Chief Dunn raping his daughter, and that I wrote a fraudulent letter when I was in a BLACP legal chair, you know, all these things that were false, but, you know, Chief Dunn was busy laughing about the prospect of me being gang raped in prison and you ignored that. No, as long as you continue to do those kinds of things, you're not going to be good for New Hampshire or for the country. And that's just the way it is. I mean, look what she condoned in my case. I mean, are you kidding me? Really? See, when you get up into New Hampshire, it doesn't matter how many trials you've won, or what kind of public policy you've changed in Nashua, who you've teamed with and, and done good things, or doesn't matter if you have a mayoral commendation, you're still a... Represented, and they said it was a lie. They went to had a meeting with a disciplinary committee chairman Londy McCaffrey, now now federal magistrate McCaffrey. My lawyer met with her, said that the report was falsified. It was a lie. Then it went to the professional conduct committee. And Margaret Nelson, she looked at it and she said that finds no mis misconduct. The part that really bothers me about that is that during 2006, when my case was being heard, the rule of evidence was preponderance of evidence. All three people involved in making the decision decided to use clear and convincing evidence. It did not exist in the state of New Hampshire at that time. As a matter of fact, 
And on January 18th of 2007, Justice Delanus went into the files and made some changes and put it in on a temporary basis. I could not find any record of there being a meeting with the Supreme Court Advisory Committee, Rules Advisory Committee. I looked at the minutes of, of the meetings going back a year and a half, and I can't, see, I can't find any mention of changing the rule of evidence from preponderance of evidence to clear and convincing evidence. Not only that, the clear and convincing evidence at the screening process is, is fairly unheard of in, in the U.S. It usually has to be through a hearing or trial. At the screening process, if we did that when we had a grand jury or someone was being indicted, very few people would go to trial, let alone go to jail. My question is, why have you created, or why did Justice Delaney's go out to create a system by which it makes it difficult for the public to seek justice from a lawyer that has done them wrong? So I noticed the way that this went was Justice Delaney's introduced clear and convincing evidence in January, on January 18th. In March, it became official, but the public hearing for it was not until June, in which case I went and I spoke about it, and I also gave a six-page report on why it should not be used. Although, when Justice Delanus and the committee had their meeting, they produced 22 pages of documentation that went into deep detail of everyone that spoke, except me. The only thing they put for me was, with respect to the suggestion made by Mr. Ginsburg during the committee's June public hearing on motion of Justice Delanus, second by Judge Campy, the committee voted to recommend to the Supreme Court that the standard of proof not be amended at this time. I don't know how you, you use something in this state that is not the law and then put it into law later on. And I don't know how it's possible that three separate committees could possibly use the wrong rules of evidence without there being collusion, if not a conspiracy. I then took my case. I filed Rule 11 for original jurisdiction with the Supreme Court. Justice Horton was brought in to review the case, and the case was accepted. After going through, I would say, about 12 motions filing, which I believe supported my case even further, the Supreme Court took Justice Horton out of the mix and brought in Justice Brock, who had a conflict of interest with this lawyer. The lawyer's name is John Griffith. <clears throat> Justice Brock and, and Justice, and excuse me, and Attorney Griffith, very good friends. It was a conflict of interest that I believe the Supreme Court was very much aware of, and certainly Justice Delanus was aware of it. After accepting my case for, for briefs and oral hearing, Attorney Griffith objected to the case being heard at all. The Professional Conduct Committee refused to hand the case files over to the Supreme Court. And out of nowhere, the Supreme Court vacated the case. And what year was that? That was in 2007. Excuse me, I think it was 2006 the Supreme Court vacated my rule of law. You could bring your case or your comments to a closure. If you have some items, Arthur, that you want to leave with us, we'd be glad to. I, I can send. I just want to make the statement that I think that everyone should know is that 
but just the way this broad and clear convincing evidence. Those new rules impose a very stiff burden of proof to initial screening of a complaint against a lawyer. This is only going to result in complaints being dismissed at the screening stage and will permit dishonest lawyers to 